Welcome to BizTech's CEO Conversation Show, the show where we feature CEOs across Asia talking about their businesses and also how they make a difference. Today, we feature Sridhar Pinapuredi, the Chairman and CEO of Cloud4C and Control S. Control S is the Asia's largest rated for data center and managed services provider and a trusted advisor to over 4,000 customers in 25 countries and 52 locations, including 60 of the Fortune 500 global multinationals. Now, Srida, with that, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you, Bistek. Srida, let's start by telling us about what the Control S Group does and also, of course, um, Cloud4C. Yes, um, Control S owns and operates uh, rated four data centers or tier four data centers, uh, as popularly known as. And um, these are our uh, current install capacities over 100 megawatt. We serve almost uh, six of the Fortune 10 and about 20 plus Fortune 100 and many thousands of uh, uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are um, spread over a, a, a million square feet, over uh, 100 megawatt uh, under use, and another 300 megawatt under construction. So, where are your Nolia centers located, and do you own them, or are they uh, yeah. uh, operated? We by own them. Yes, we own, and we built, we custom built uh, all these data centers, and. Uh, uh, we own uh, uh, most of these data centers. We have a joint venture with uh, Bombay Stock Exchange, a joint initiative, I would say, in one of the data centers. Another one with uh, National Stock Depositories Limited. And the uh, rest of our all, um, those two are joint initiatives, rest are uh, owned by uh, Control S. These are custom built, all are lead platinum certified one the most energy efficient data centers uh, for the last 10 12 years in 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 a row um and uh, we've done over 200 innovations uh, in establishing these data centers to make it uh, make them uh, a lot more energy efficient lower the cost of ownership while investing in tier 4 rated 4 data centers and what was your background pr prior to starting the business I've been an entrepreneur all through, Brian. Um, right from age of uh, 17, is that's when I started my first journey as an entrepreneur while I was in college uh, by developing, um, writing some code software. Um, and, uh, you know, um, or mostly to play with the computer, uh, I would say. That's how we started. And uh, one thing led to the other. We built an internet services company I built my own software products uh, in telecom areas, and uh, then uh, did IT consulting. Um, that's when, while doing the internet services business, I see fiber going everywhere, all homes to offices, and the price of bandwidth came crashing down to by 99.8%, I would say. <laughs> Okay. So uh, just to give you an, an example, it used to, when I started the business, it used to cost us about a quarter million dollars for a two Mbps pipe. Today, you get that for $10 and you get uh, probably a 20 MB pipe home. So that's the kind of, uh, see, when I saw that crashing down and uh, fiber going home, so I, I got this interesting idea that why this IT can be done from data centers. It need not be run from individual companies uh, own server rooms and uh, all these people who are needed like 10 20 people for organization are not required because it can all be done centrally what is which is what you call cloud today yes so th this idea came to me 13 or almost 14 years ago and i started building data centers as well as uh, uh, cloud services and uh, we have uh, as part of the cloud services business uh, into a separate company because it needed a different management. It had a much bigger growth than data centers as well. And we started Cloud4C about six years ago. And uh, we've seen over 100% growth this EAGR for the, over the last four or five years, a 2 million company going to 106 million US company in less than five years and uh, with a 26 country presence. Wow. And how did you scale the business? What were the key milestones in your growth business and how did you get the funding to do that 
uh, interesting story. Uh, we built Cloud 4C without any funding, external, zero. Uh, not that uh, we've invested a lot of uh, promoter groups money now. I built this company. Um, uh, we needed, of course, a lot of you know, setting up cloud pods across. We needed a lot of capex as well. It's not that That's totally right. light here. Yeah. So um, we took the help of our technology vendors. I mean, um, the likes of Cisco, Dell, and uh, Intel, HP, and uh, so you got vendor financing essentially. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We did vendor mm -hmm. financing on one side. And on the other side, uh, some of our large customers, we went to them and said, uh, uh, hey, uh, we are going to give you 10% discount if you give us one year in uh, payments in advance. So we did customer financing as well. And uh, yes, uh, so we have invested over 100 million US uh, in this, using these two models uh, in, into this business. Um, so everyone are happy, our, our vendors are happy, our customers are happy because they got the um, best of the services and uh, our vendors got amazing business. At the same time, um, uh, you know, it helped the company not to give away expensive equity. Yeah. And, and what do you think that, so obviously these are some of the key things that you did right. What were perhaps some of the missteps that you made that you took lessons from as you grew the business? <laughs> many, many, I would say. Uh, I've, I've probably done the most mistakes than any other entrepreneur. Um, uh, and learned from them, um, including some of them were fatal. Some of them almost took me to the, you know. Uh, you know, tell, share with us some of the, 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 the really tough ones, that, the mistakes that you made that really uh, got you in trouble. Um, I would say not silly, but um, I couldn't see the future. I think the biggest ability a CEO or a leader needs to have is the ability to develop a vision, ability to see what's going to happen and guide those companies in the right direction and his people in the right direction. I think um when i was um i started i said you know 17 and then by 28 i built a few companies and uh probably i was um, i couldn't see what was coming or i was headstrong that i i thought i was a gifted uh, uh, man with a golden touch nothing can go wrong with me whatever you call it right so uh, that's when things have started uh, going wrong and i was caught up in a much um, like in 2007 after that meltdown, um, had I anticipated the the repercussions of that, I would have taken actions within uh, within 10, 12 months. Of course, we came out of it, but it took us three, four years to come out of it, rather than uh, had I known it, uh, had I, or looking back, if I had the same wisdom as I have today, or experience of learning from those mistakes, right. uh, probably I would have guided the companies much better. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, over a period of time, I've learned how to develop insights into, you know, what's happening um, in around us, in the industry, as well as, uh, you know, other uh, patterns which are emerging, uh, which which could affect this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it, it yes, so, so some of those things that I've learned are, uh, number one is to... Um, watch out watch out for not just your competitors watch out your industry and not just the industry the whole world assets because something else happening somewhere which is totally unconnected would could disrupt your industry right so yeah. and covid is a classic example of that absolutely absolutely yeah i i think i steered the company well uh when i saw the first few cases reported in china i was okay with it and uh, but the moment I saw a few incidents in Singapore, in and uh, what one person could go from Singapore um, to, uh, uh, for example, in um, in London, and the same person goes to uh, to my ski resort where I was there at the time mm -hmm. uh, in, in in France, 
uh, I have understood very clearly that this is not something which can be. Uh, so by the time in the, it took India, three months later it hit India, uh, but by that time we were already working from home. And how did that impact the business overall? Because for a data center business and for your managed services business, essentially the pandemic has enabled you to grow on steroids. Uh, yes, true. Uh, that um, the pandemic has made um, companies rush to cloud. Yes. And uh, those companies which were not considering cloud at all also suddenly felt that, look, I mean, a situation like this, a cloud company is better to serve them rather than their own small team uh, because cloud companies are much better. Uh, equipped to manage uh, during the pandemic and um, uh, so yes there is some kind of a positive um, forces acted upon the industry yes but at the same time um, like two years ago I moved to Singapore set up base personally and has lived there with the hope that I would be able to travel around from Singapore easily because that's the most connected country in the world yes. and um, and establish uh, the businesses more firmly of course we are in Malaysia we are in Indonesia we are in Philippines we are in all the countries of Southeast Asia but I wanted to build local management teams make you know, further investments, build data centers. All of those plans have been kind of pushed. I hope uh, by end of this year, I, I, I will be able to continue that. Yes, we still we made some investments. We have now local management teams across all these countries. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, we have already shortlisted several locations to build data centers in uh, most of these countries. Could you share which countries you're thinking of building data centers? Because now Singapore has put a stop on data center construction, right? Because it takes too much of energy. Yes, Malaysia. Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, we have already shortlisted locations in Vietnam. Uh, we are looking at a joint venture partner for Philippines. Uh, we are in talks with a few few of the players in Thailand. We shortlisted. We did a location studies uh, already completed. Um, yeah, so we are looking at all of these countries. Yeah. Now, in terms of these data, how many data centers are you looking to build in ASEAN? And are you going to take the approach of an asset light strategy where you 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 build, you operate, but then financially, you basically offset that against in, in a form of a REIT, which is now very popular, for example, for listing in Singapore. Uh, right now, we are investing between uh, around a couple of hundred million US dollars per year, um, which is kind of self-funded um, uh, with the cash flows from existing cash flows from companies and uh, a little bit of uh, debt as well as, as I said, customer financing. Uh, so uh, between all of these, we are, we are doing it on our own. But soon, once we step up uh, uh, our global expansion, we would be investing uh, anywhere. It could be a close to a billion dollars a year. That's the time. Uh, we would go towards a REIT or uh, take the company public. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, I want to now zoom back to you as the experienced entrepreneur. So you mentioned just now that, uh, you know, you're skiing in France, so you obviously enjoy skiing. I understand you also enjoy things like cycling, biking, and trekking. So you're a very avid fitness enthusiast. How has that shaped you as an entrepreneur? Have you always been like that since a teenager or has that changed as you built your business? I have learned it another lesson the hard way. I would say this is to be, uh, what I mean to say is that I was not at all a, a sports freak. I was working around the clock. Um, I would work 18 days, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, no exercise, no socializing. And it continued for many years. And um, I realized that productivity was getting lower and lower and lower over a period of time. And especially when I was uh, hit, uh, I was going through the stress of 
uh, you know, distressed companies, running distressed companies, whenever we went through patch, bad patch, um, the performance even went down. Um, that's when I uh, met a teacher who taught me yoga and bit uh, Vedanta. That's where it started. I quickly realized that doing these activities suddenly gave my a, a kind of a um, what do you call a, a booster shot to my brain. I started working um, much more uh, efficiently. And that led me, so I did yoga for two, three years, and then I realized that there was a lot more to outdoor nature, you know. So I started exploring hiking, then I started uh, doing biking, motor biking in Himalayas, um, then skiing. Uh, in Singapore, I do stand up water board. Uh, quite often, you'll see me in, on Sentosa waters. Uh -huh. or, uh, Kayaking, hiking. I know almost all the all the uh, nooks and corners of Singapore now. By walk, I I discovered all of them in the last uh, year and a half. So, <clears throat> uh, what changed is that uh, you know every, with each of these experiences, I've realized that um, uh, I I picked up great friends because all these activities are you do with someone. Mm -hmm. um, so last month I was in Sweden. I learned golf for the first time. Uh, yes, I did uh, mountain biking for the first time. I, both are amazing experiences. So everywhere, you, whatever you do, you you meet some amazing people. So instead of socializing in uh, in uh, in our restaurants or bars, I socialize uh, now pretty much on outdoor, and uh, it's amazing. So you. You stay fit, you meet great people, you enjoy the nature and refresh yourself so you go back to work in a much more focused manner. Sridhar, you're also a member of Thai, the Indus Entrepreneurs, um, which is originally out of the Silicon Valley. Tell us about your involvement in Thai and how you got involved in angel investing. Okay, um, Thai is a community um, of experienced entrepreneurs, we call them charter members. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the charter of this, uh, this organization is, is to help uh, young entrepreneurs, help uh, create a ecosystem for, for these uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, okay. youngsters who want to become entrepreneurs. Or uh, scale up the existing businesses to the next level. Uh, through various programs. Uh, it starts from, the program starts at school level where the charter members go and teach about entrepreneurship, conduct uh, competitions in college to that of uh, uh, the uh, prospective entrepreneurs who are looking at building something uh, to that of next level of nurturing the existing companies. And all the charter members volunteer uh, a certain hours to spend with these people and we do a matchmaking and uh, we have investor meet meeting platforms we connect with the uh, agile invest investment communities we also work with incubators so um, worldwide um, um, chapters are there all across uh, and about i think about 60 odd countries try spread over over uh, 20,000 members and um, i'm you know, very happy to be associated uh, with Thai. Um, as usual, the you know, I was pulled in in the beginning into mm -hmm. Thai by a couple of my friends, and uh, uh, one of my uh, friends said, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm becoming the president. Why don't you become a board member?" I said, okay, and uh, then the next year they said, uh, Sridhar, we want you to become the I know, president uh, by becoming vice president this year, we want you to head. Next year, that's how it started. Then uh, during my presidency, we had um, a global summit um, and, uh, and it was to be done online. It was supposed to be done by Dubai, uh, but uh, 
let's say, did the COVID, uh, we would rather postpone it to next year. That's when we picked up. And uh, we actually took it as an opportunity to build a much bigger platform. So instead of 2,000 people, we had over 30,000 people attending this uh, round the clock, 60 hour conference and uh, over 400 plus investor community and uh, five, 600 speakers, globally eminent speakers, including Bill Gates that uh, uh, come into this. Uh, it was a great occasion for me to um, you know lead this uh, initiative and uh, plan the whole thing, work with 60 plus entrepreneurs. That's another amazing experience I never worked with. Uh, community, uh, a larger community of entrepreneurs who have, um, each one has their own ideas. Imagine how it would be to uh, <laughs> pull this event with them. So I had my issues, uh, but uh, in the end, I um, mean, amazing contribution from everyone. Yeah, that would be too good to have. And, you know, as an angel investor, uh, what have you learned in the lessons uh, of investing in individual entrepreneurs? Um, so far, we have um, we are only investing in uh, this. Uh, we have started this uh, in Singapore. The family office has been started. Primary aim of this uh, investment vehicle is to um, right now it is uh, enterprise uh, enterprise SaaS enterprise services uh, okay. companies or enterprise technologies uh, companies which are in enterprises. So we've done about four of those uh, till date. Um, and uh, one is a, a process mining company called Big Little Innovations um, based out of California. Another one we have invested is in a robotic process automation company in India. Uh, a third one we've invested is in SAP technologies, ERP technologies mm -hmm. um, in India. And then a fourth one is a SAP consulting company in Singapore. Uh, that we acquired it, uh, the SAP consulting company. Um, and we are looking at similar um, uh, technologies and uh, not strictly angel investing, I would say these are. These are um, strategic investments as well. We are helping uh, these companies uh, go to the next, next level because we have over 200 salespeople and we are selling to enterprises. So, so we- It's an easy plug and play fit. It's strategic to your core business. For business and for them also they are getting a straight away all they need to do is deliver uh, 100x or, uh, yeah because like they've got market access like you said 200 sales people like existing relationships around the world yeah so that's what we are doing right now uh, but by i think by next year subject to travel covid uh, away i hope by this year end we will be there uh, but next year we'll have a full-fledged uh, organization to do uh, uh, investments other than enterprise and uh, enterprise services and enterprise. So you know, you've lived in Singapore for, or you lived in Singapore for one and a half years before just coming back to India. Yeah. How? What is your view on the Indian startup ecosystem versus the Singapore startup ecosystem? What are the maybe the different because it's obviously different flavors how do the different flavors look like or taste like Singapore is much more mature uh, you have seasoned um, let's say um, investment vehicles many of them uh, I would say many of them chasing a few entrepreneurs because, yeah because yeah uh, it's a reverse situation in India um, yes, we have seasoned entrepreneurs, very mature, um, uh, uh, but also a lot of budding entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. Uh, overall, for an entrepreneur, uh, uh, except the manpower, there is an issue because of the, the current situation. Hiring uh, becomes uh, tough uh, and bringing in talent from outside has become even more difficult of late, but otherwise, Singapore is a great country. I mean, uh, the law and order, the uh, the whole ecosystem it is needed. The, the, the financial system to support the entrepreneurs, the investors, the mentors, um, community. Um, I would say that it's on par with uh, Silicon Valley today. So you know, what advice would you give? You know, you you've been through the ups and downs. 
you are now on an accelerated growth path. What advice would you give these entrepreneurs who are now trying to grow their business? What are some of maybe three key things that they need to do or think about when they're growing their business? One of the things which you mentioned earlier in the interview, which I took note of, was the fact that you really need to keep looking ahead. Yep. Keep looking ahead, number one, of course. Um, uh, second, probably, would be create differentiators. Do not bank on typical sales marketing engines. Um, uh, you know, I mean, many of you would have read Blue Ocean Strategy. Yeah. Use that as an inspiration and create as many differentiators as possible and ring fence them and move away as much as possible from your competitors make competition irrelevant by not by doing things di completely different from them that will get you uh 20x the valuation or double the valuation of your com competitors and double the profits for sure so um, what it means is you know Keep away from the temptations of me too business uh, and uh, and just focus on strategic differentiators that's number one that's, that's probably the top most thing that i have done in all my companies and um, another thing that i have done i don't know good or bad but it's working for me so <laughs> i'm i'm not a professor or i'm not a season that season that to preach people but i can share my experiences another one i've i've seen is that if your business is excessively dependent on a few customers or a few suppliers, also you have a uh, serious issue because obviously they would want uh, to protect their balance sheets. It, you know, it's natural phenomenon. So uh, try to avoid those situations. So diversified customer base is key. I would say so. Um, or the customer should have. We have a, a few concentrations. A few customers we do a lot of business with. In that situation, um, as long as your value add is something, a clear unique differentiator. For example, we are Cloud 4C is focused on in mostly emerging markets for cloud. Um, and there is no one else. So the value add that we give to this, these clients is so significant that even if even though you're concentrated on you know, on one company a lot of business still it's risk-free um, but you need to have something um, solid much more than your competitors to uh, to continuously grow that brand and make it bigger and bigger measure uh, what we do i'll tell you uh, we measure customer satisfaction every day uh, we developed a total ownership index and um, uh, we developed that uh, we, so we uh, every transaction which happens we take a feedback and make it a part of our um, not just take feedback and keep quiet but it it, it um, dovetails into many processes inside the company for improvement yeah and we do a net promoter scores uh, when we started out, we said a services company, 40% would be great. We achieved 40, then I said 50, we did. Then we did 60 uh, percent uh, NPS score. And I'm um, surprised two days ago, uh, I was in an uh, executive meeting at the company. They themselves said, we will go to 90%. We'll keep a target of 90% NPS this year. That's their, you know. I didn't, I didn't push it because I was very happy, but my leadership team, they're not happy. They want to push to 90%. So we do that almost on a daily basis. It's a religion and everyone in the company knows that what customer think matters, what we, what we think doesn't matter. So that's one thing which worked us, worked very, very well for us. Another thing which worked was uh, uh, we measure uh, employee satisfaction, uh, mm -hmm. not daily, but uh, once a quarter, we made it a point to work on them uh, quite uh, early on, and uh, we made it a great place to work. Last two years, 
this was a tougher challenge than uh, getting a CSAT. Yeah, <laughs> getting employee satisfaction not easy. Not easy. We need to evolve as an organization, build a culture of uh, inclusivity, build a culture of uh, uh, a, 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 a fun kind of culture, yet at the same time passionate. Um, uh, we need to develop, change our entire leadership style. Uh, I personally have to evolve as a human being. Um, and uh, oh, it's the same is the case with all our leadership team. A uh, number of challenges, yes. And we, there's a lot to learn for us in that space. But I would recommend that anyone starting a business, keep this in mind. You're, you should have passionate and happy employees. Sridhar, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful guest. Pleasure. Pleasure, Brian. Thank you very much. Now, we've been speaking to Srida Pinapur Reddy, Chairman and CEO of Cloud4C and Control S, and on BizTech's CEO Conversation Show. I'm Brian Fernandez. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.